Welcome to part six of us restoring a rare 1984 videotape vending machine. Buckle up, kids, because we're going to get super technical, but it's still going to be fun. And by that, I mean, uh, hey, look over there. <laughs> Today, we're breaking out the logic probe, which sounds like a tool you'd use to interrogate a computer during a courtroom drama set inside a radio shack. We're using it to chase signals from our CPU board to figure out where they're disappearing on the hardware board, because apparently electrons can just ghost you now. You can see the probe react to signals in this connector as I gently poke each pin like I'm diffusing a bomb with a toothpick. When we tell the computer to move the transport, the signal's gonna shift from high to low and low to high, like it's having a full bipolar meltdown. Now, according to our newly acquired documentation, pin 13 should show five volts DC when the transport is not in motion. The logic probe lets out a high-pitched beep, turns on a red LED, and calls this a high signal because apparently we're assigning vibes to voltages now. When I press the up keypad button to actually move the transport, the voltage is going to drop to near zero volts and you're going to hear a low-pitched beep and you see a green LED light up like the probe is a robot that's just giving up. It's a tool that literally goes beep if something's working and beep if it's not. Classic. So the 8 button is the up manual control. We're going to hit it and let's see what happens and the voltage goes down to low. Yeah, we did it. And I'm going to let go and it goes back to 5 volts. Amazing. It never gets back to here though. You never see this light up. So there's a problem. So let's make sure everything is working. We know that it will go left if I hit the button for left. So pin 12 is left. I'm going to go pull up my menu and I'm going to see which direction is left. Left is going to be the when I hit the number 4 on the keypad. All right, so let's go and hit number four, and you can hear the motor, right? There it goes, it's working. You can see the voltage change, but in this case, the transport's actually moving. So this is great, right? And look, even the light lights up. So that means the signal gets all the way down and it's moving, look at that. That's, that's beautiful, I love this, this is great. So let's follow the power from this one big IC chip down to this other big IC chip and then there's six guys on the left. The first two stops on the train are LS240s. These are buffering inverter chips. They take power and then flip them from five volts to zero volts and zero volts to five volts. Okay, you get that? All right, so let's look at the data sheet for the chip. It is not as complicated as it sounds. So we're gonna zoom in a little bit here and like like pin two here, one A1, the output for that is one Y1 over there on uh, the right on pin 18. There's a better chart where you see like the pin and it's input on the left here and, and then on the right you see the pin and its output. So way easier. So we're gonna go straight to a chip and we're gonna check the output side. I'm gonna hit the button and see if any, yeah, look, oh yeah. So we're getting we're getting data coming through on the output. So that means this is good, all right? I still don't hear the, the transport moving, and I don't know why I checked the input side, but hey, look at that. All right, so that means it's another chip down the line. It's one of these little guys that have six pins on it. And these are pretty cool. They're opto-couplers, meaning there's actually a little LED inside, and one side lights up, and then the receiver picks it up, and then it sends like a whole bunch of voltage across. And, and these fail a lot, like the little LEDs in la inside don't last forever. So these are very sus. We're gonna check on this side. I'm gonna hit the button and here we go. Let's reach up there. Okay, so I'm getting data on the input side. Very impressive, but still the transport doesn't move. There's several of these inputs. I'm not sure which one it is. And then on the other side is the output. And we're going to check over here. And let's see. Oh, actually, look at that. I can trigger the transport by touching two together. Okay, that's pretty wild. This means that we're definitely going to need to see some activity on this side when I hit the buttons. Here I am making the transport move by touching two little pins. It's pretty awesome. We're going to do it a little bit more to all of them just because I have nothing else better to do. Uh, and this is quite entertaining that you're kind of doing it this way instead of hitting those buttons. All right, so now we're going to see, I'm going to hit the button on the transport, uh, the keypad rather. And uh, you see, nothing's coming. So the other side of the optocoupler is failing. And that's kind of cool. This actually is pinpointing our issue. And you know what we need to do? We're going to need to buy some optocouplers. Yeah. All right, moments after this amazing discovery, I was on the Ebays purchasing 15 optocouplers to repair my VHS vending machine. Because why buy 14 optocouplers when you can buy 15 optocouplers? Am I right? <laughs> Hello? 
Let's fast forward one week because time is meaningless and our optocouplers have finally arrived. So naturally we're setting up our full soldering station on the patio like normal people who do delicate electronics work outdoors next to wind, bugs, and a DeLorean, which we are as usual completely ignoring. So we've busted out our Hacko desoldering iron, which is basically a tiny robotic nose that sniffs disappointment off old circuit boards. It's got a little vacuum inside. It slurps up the solder like it's hot queso and thank God there's only six pins per chip because otherwise I'd still be out here till next Tuesday. Once the chips removed, we check the board because the last thing we need is lifting a pad and ruining the board. We're not here to make new problems. We're here to gently anger old ones. Next we install some dual wipe sockets because listen, we might have bought fake chips off the internet so we're not soldering anything directly in like amateurs. Also in 40 years some poor soul, him, her, cyborg, whatever, is going to be fixing this again and we are going to be better ancestors. All right, like a true pro, we've gotten our second chip out and we're gonna jar it loose. All right, let's check that out. Nice clean work. We didn't take any of the pads off. Very beautiful. We're gonna put a new socket in just like we did on the other side. We're gonna check our work again to make sure we stuck it through the right holes. That's what she said. We now apply some flux, which no, we did not get from the flux capacitor. Thank you for asking. We bought it at Ace Electronics, our beloved purveyor of vintage electronics and I assume cursed trinkets from broken calculators. The flux lubricates the solder, which sounds inappropriate, but it's actually very wholesome. Okay, we're firing up our soldering iron to 600 blazing degrees. It's almost like we're on the sun. We're going to solder the socket back on like we're a pro. Don't smell this. It's not what you think. It's not, it doesn't smell great. It's not like gasoline, like when you're waiting for the bus, you know? Remember, you know how that, when you are a kid? Hey, you, you don't remember that? Oh, okay. That's embarrassing. All right, we're checking our work, and here's our new optocoupler. We're going to put it back into its place, but now through a socket or into a socket. And we got the second one. We're gonna do that. Check our weather. It's beautiful, right? Just they look taller. Like you, you can play basketball now. We're gonna put everything back together. Make sure everything's nice and solid. And we're gonna go into the keypad menu and see if we can start this guy up. We obviously need to turn the power on. I did not see any magic smoke come out. We're waiting for it to boot up. This is the this is the most exciting part. We're wait, actually waiting for bubble memory to heat up. That's a lot of fun. Uh, someone was telling me about bubble memory. I, I'm gonna look up some bubble memory jokes, but I don't have any right now. I don't know what's being printed out. I'm just gonna ignore that. All right, let's get into our menu, and we're gonna start to move the transport with the CPU board and see if we can now have signals go all the way across the hardware board. And move the transport. All right. Oh, look at that! Look at that! It, it's going. It's going in a direction it hasn't been able to go. That. That means things are working. Yeah! All right, and it's going up, very nice. Remember, we couldn't do that either. <laughs> wow, this is freaking awesome. I, I don't even, it's ready to be open? Oh my God, we did it, <laughs> yay! Great success. It's time for an easy win, and by that, I mean something that does not involve using my brain. And by that, I mean we're replacing the worn out sticker on the video vendor's transport platform. The current sticker, it's stanky. That's right. It's both hard to read and emits an aura of sadness and old microwave popcorn. So we recreated it digitally in Adobe Illustrator like graphic design adults and then we sent the file to our friend Real Omega who in return sent us perfect pristine replicas that look like they were printed in 1984 by a government agency that gave a <laughs> Now look, we love replacing stickers. Some people collect coins. We replace adhesive rectangles on forgotten machines. You know, it's a lifestyle. But then you get those people, the contrarian historians who say things like, you should keep it original or preserve the patina. And I'm like, who is Tina and why is she everywhere? Like, what power does she hold? Anyway, back to shredding the ancient sticker like it's a medieval scroll that insulted my family. And we replaced it with a modern one that will absolutely last longer, probably through the next ice age. Now, here's the thing, removing old stickers it's an art form, a fine art, but not like, you know, oil painting. It's more like a competitive wallpaper peeling. If you speed up the process in time lapse, people are impressed. Ooh, look how fast and clean it is. But if you show it in real time, it's just 10 solid minutes of a grown adult aggressively whispering, come on, 
while scraping dried glue with an expired library card. This time I only sped it up to 200%, which in YouTube terms means I'm not interested in becoming rich, and, and clearly that's on me. So as we finish obliterating the old sticker, just absolutely destroying it like it owed us money, we wipe down the surface like we're about to put it back in a box and send it off to Antique Roadshow. And now, the moment has come, we break out Real Omega's flawless replica sticker and slap it down by eyeballing it. That's right, no rulers, no measuring tape, just me, my instincts, and a quiet voice in my head screaming, This is a bad idea. Because nothing says classy restoration like replacing a carefully recreated piece of 1980s artwork by making it just slightly crooked and then wondering who'll notice. And the answer is me, forever. Now in reality, I did reapply it a second time, but I did not film it because I don't want to create documents proof that I care this much about a sticker on a dead format rental machine. That's between me, my conscience, and the ghost of every expired Blockbuster card. And just like that, I'm calling it great success. Crooked, redone, unfilmed, <laughs> great success.